So then this is the compendium of all the data from these satellites, which shows that the whole northern hemisphere has a higher methane concentration than the southern hemisphere. Now, the, the sources of methane in the world are, there's a lot of them, and some of them are natural, and some of them are unnatural. Um, the, the natural ones include termites, which produce methane when they're doing their thing in there. Um, but a very big source of methane is uh, animal husbandry. And, and, uh, and this is obviously something you're very concerned about in this meeting. But uh, if, you, if you have a large number of domestic animals and, and the number increases all the time, like it does in China now, then the, the, those animals are producing methane at a rapid rate. And um, it's a significant contributor to the total methane output uh, of the, into the planet into the atmosphere. So that's a big contributor. And um, another one that's of unknown size, because nobody admits to what it, what it actually is, is methane re released from leaks in, in, pi in gas pipelines and from leaks in fracking operations. Like the Russians uh, used to have uh, gas pipelines coming from the Arctic across the tundra where they would lay six pipelines in parallel without any kind of support. They'd just be lying on the tundra. And then as the tundra melted, uh, or there was some upheaval, uh, some pipelines would break. And they wouldn't bother, because if they have six pipelines and two of them break, they've still got four pipelines transmitting the gas. But the fact that the other two are leaking gas into the atmosphere was something they wouldn't bother with. They do now because they realize how valuable the gas is. But in the past, there was a lot of leakage from gas pipelines, most of them Russian. And now there's leaking, leakage from fracking, fracking operations, which again is not admitted to. So we've got methane going into the atmosphere from man's technical operations, methane going into the atmosphere from man's uh, animal husbandry operations, and m going into the atmosphere from a few natural sources, but now we add to that methane coming up from the seabed and being emitted to the atmosphere around the Arctic coastlines. And this is what, what, by tracing back the sources here, it looks as if this distribution map looks as if the origin of a lot of that methane is high latitudes in, in the north. So the, the, that may be the contributor why you have more methane in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. There's other reasons, but it looks as if the, uh, the Arctic methane threat is becoming real. Um, now, we, we've been working with these, the Russians who've been doing this work, and one of them predicted uh, that there would be 50 gigatons of methane could come out in a single pulse. Uh, by calculating how fast the permafrost is, is melting, um, she predicted that you, you could get, uh, within a, a year or two of emission, uh, 50 gigatons coming out, which is, uh, sounds like a huge figure, in fact it is, but it's, it's only about less than 10% of the amount of methane that's sitting there in the sediments. So uh, it's quite a conservative estimate, only 10% of the methane being emitted, but we did a study of what that would do to climate if it all comes out in, in, um, in this case, we allowed it 10 years to come out. So we, uh, so we published a paper in Nature which caused a huge amount of controversy and we, we were told that we were alarmist. And, um, uh, but in fact, um, people now are kind of agreeing that this could happen. And um, here's the, the blue here is, the, I shouldn't have put the thing on the background, but the blue line here is the warming of the world in the next 80 years on a business as usual uh, estimate. Uh, that gives you to about four degrees of warming. The red line is, is, the different, is what happens if you have a methane outbreak uh, of 50 gigatons, and it 
almost immediately gives you 0.6 of a degree of extra warming and that persists, gradually fades away, persists to the end of the century. And these, these other lines are if we, if we do other things that have a big emissions or small emissions. But the difference between the blue and the red is the methane pulse. And that's giving us 0.6 of a degree, which if it's, if it's applied suddenly would have enormously bad effects on the world. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, well, nobody's really thought what it would do, but, but we, we did a study uh, using one of the, the my fellow authors did, used the a, a, a economic model that was developed um, for the Stern Review, which was a, a British government review of effects of global warming. And um, they used various m models for economic impacts. And the conclusion was if you have uh, 50 gigatons methane pulse, not only will it give you 0.6 of a degree of warming, but the total cost to the world of all the harmful effects of that will be $60 trillion. So we put that in the paper, and, and general sort of fear and terror of, about that. And, and, uh, we, I guess we, we should have been more cautious, but in fact, that's what, that's what the model came out with, that uh, you, 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 you're adding $60 trillion, which itself is only about 15% of the economic cost of global warming. So it's, a, it's, it's only adding 15% to the, the horror that we're already facing. Um, and the, the thing is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tends to ignore this, this threat, but they don't ignore an equally bad threat, which is that um, the permafrost on land is also thawing um, over a huge area that's the whole of northern Asia. And it's, it's thawing more slowly than this offshore permafrost, but it's still thawing slowly. And the total amount of methane that will be released this century from that is about the same as the total amount of methane that will be released in a single burst. So even if we don't get a quick burst, which does us in, um, we'll get a slow methane emission, which will, will cause the same in the long term, the same effect. And we can see that happening wherever we do measurements. Um, this is some measurements of permafrost at Dead Horse, Alaska, which is near Prudhoe Bay. And we can see how rapidly the, the, the frozen soil warms up. Wherever you look, you're seeing warming of permafrost, melting of permafrost, buildings collapsing because they're built on permafrost. So we'll get the methane whether we like it or not, whether, whether we do something about the offshore Arctic, whether we can do, it, can do anything, or whether we simply, we're lucky and we don't, get a, we don't get an outbreak from offshore, we'll still get the methane from, from the land, the decay on land. Okay, so that's, uh, that's methane. Um, then I come on to weather, and the link between weather extremes and um, uh, ice is, is slightly, uh, slightly more dubious. Um, it, it's, I think it's, it's quite strong, uh, but, um, but the, the, um, a lot of scientists say it's unproven. Uh, the person who's done the most, uh, in fact, on this and thinks it is due to ice is Jennifer Hutchings at uh, Rutgers University. So she was a colleague of lady last night and at the panel. Um, and the way it, it works uh, is, is this, uh, that, here we are, um, that it's, it's all due to the, the jet stream. So what happens is uh, the jet stream is the, is the fast flowing, narrow, fast flowing air mass that, that separates the, the polar air over the Arctic from tropical air masses. It's a boundary between two air masses. Now, because the Arctic's warming faster than the tropical uh, latitudes, the, the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics is going down. It's, there's less of a con temperature contrast between the Arctic and, and the tropics. So this, this boundary, uh, the winds in this boundary are less, become less strong 
the jet stream weakens. And the jet stream normally, or used to be, more or less a straight line. If you, if you were in it, it meant it was a fast flight from North America to Europe and a slow flight from Europe to North America. Um, so it, made, it makes a difference. To, it can be up to 200 miles an hour. But uh, it, was, it was more or less a straight line. But as it slowed down because of this uh, warming of the Arctic, then it became, uh, it became bendy. It, it, it broke up into these lobes where instead of being a straight line, it's, and typically that, that often happens when a, uh, a current weakens, it, it, it um, develops eddies. So this, this has developed these lobes, and the lobes are quite stable. They sit there like this, and you can see that uh, here, um, if we look at the Pacific Northwest, you've got polar air coming down to a lower latitude than it ought to be, so you're getting very much colder conditions in the Pacific Northwest than you, you will get in an average year. Uh, over in, in the Midwest here, you're also you're getting much warmer conditions because the, the tropical air is reaching up to higher latitudes than it should be. In the Northeast, you're getting colder conditions because the, the polar air is coming down to a lower latitude. So all around the world, you're having alternating zones of extremely warm weather and extremely cold weather. And sometimes the extremes are so extreme that they break records. So that's why we talk about weather extremes. And it's only been happening for the last seven or eight years, which happens to coincide to, with the period when the, the sea ice has been retreating so much in the Arctic. So um, it looks as if, according to Jennifer, that, that the retreat of sea ice and the warming of the Arctic is causing the jet stream to slow down. It's developing these big lobes. The lobes are fairly stable. They only drift around slowly. And they result in extremely warm air being in places where it shouldn't be and extremely cold air being in places where it shouldn't be. So the net effect is it's not a warming or a cooling. Uh, although, um, although our climatic expert, uh, Donald Trump, said, <laughs> <laughs> on a cold day, let's have some more of that global warming, um, indicating that, in his expert view, um, the, the, the cold air outbreak in, in north, the northeast was not due to this, but due to something else. Um, and uh, anyway, th this is what happens, and, and we do find these extremes happening, and, and they, they produce record cold or record heat. Um, so that's that's what, what a lot of scientists think are happening, is happening, and, um, and so, or something like, something like it is going on. And the result is, unfortunately, that the, where the, all these lobes are happening, the, the north uh, in, in latitudes where it shouldn't be, uh, happens to unfortunately be in the zone of the maximum crop production on the planet. So the, 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 north, the, the extreme anomalies of, of heat versus cold you're finding in North America in just the latitudes where grain is grown, same in Europe and across into uh, the, the Urals and the, the um, steppes of Asia and East Asia. These are all, unfortunately, the mid-northern latitudes and those are the latitudes where the maximum amount of, of food is grown. So, we can't, um, the, the, the jet stream anomalies that are producing this, these extremes are hitting us right where it hurts food production the most. And um, it's already started to happen, and it seemed to happen, start to happen at the beginning of this century, just like the retreat of Arctic sea ice. And, uh, Last night, several people in the panel and questions from the floor were concerned with uh, Syria and other Mideastern countries. Was the, the unrest and, and the warfare there related to hunger, lack of food? And it does look as if that would fit this, this climate extreme um, business because 
um, in 2000, the Food and Agricultural Organization produced a World Food Index, which is the average cost of food for the average person in the world. So it's, you know, it's an extremely complex thing to work out. It's, it's, you're looking at how everybody in the world eats and what the cost of their food is. And it started at 100 in 2000, and, and this is what it then did. By 2008, it had gone up to 220, and then it went down, and it's, it went up again to more than to 240 in 2011. And curiously enough, we, we haven't got any statistics after that, and uh, it's not clear whether the the FAO stopped producing them or produced them but didn't publish them. So we don't know what's happened to the World Food Price Index in, in recent years. But you can see that um, in those years, we can, we can tag the, the years of highest food prices with various revolutions, civil wars, unrest in, in countries of the third world. And you see uh, when it reached its peak, that was the Arab Spring, original Arab Spring, the Tunisian revolt. And that what arose directly from food prices. The people in Tunis were saying, we can't afford to eat. And what makes that worse is the population growth in the cities of the third world. You, you've got a huge number of young people, young men mainly, um, living in, in cities. They can't grow anything because they're not they're not traditional farmers. They, they, they're, 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 they're being born in huge numbers, living in, the, in a city, haven't got any way of earning a living, very difficult to earn a living. And if the food is expensive, which they have to buy, they can't grow, then they're really in trouble. So the food price index hits the, the population of third world cities very badly, especially young people. And they, young people are the ones who tend to riot and revolt. So you can see what, how easily a, a rise in a doubling of food prices, which happened um, up in 2008, would give you uh, riots and warfare. And then the fact that things went quiet again when the food prices went down, and then erupted again in 2011 when they went up again to even higher values, it seems to be a very strong correlation between um, global food prices and uh, warfare in cities in the third world, especially the Middle East and North Africa. And, well, and you can see Africa in general as well, but a lot of it is in Arab countries.